So we're starting a new sermon series, uh, for probably for the next three or four weeks. Um, quite simple, it's entitled Serve. And I started thinking about service. I started thinking that there's a lot of people around the world that serve. And if you think about it, the, the Boy Scouts go out and do community service. The Girl Scouts, they do service. The military go out and do service. Um, you know, a lot of different organizations, your school, maybe your work. A lot of people can serve, but there's only one organization on the planet that can serve like Jesus, and that is the bride of Christ, that is the church. And so if we go out and just do good deeds and we go out and serve, but we don't serve in the name of Jesus, then we are no different from all the other organizations that go out and serve. So service is important. The service that they do, uh, even atheists can go out and serve, but but the heart behind it is to be your hands and feet of Jesus Christ, to point people to the kingdom, to point people to the Father, to represent Christ well to the world. That's, that's the goal. That's what we're, we're after. So we're talking about service, but we're talking more than just serving. We're talking about serving like Jesus. And primarily today, we're going to look at um, your actions. Your actions can speak louder than your words, and I'm trying to flip this, this slide. It won't flip. Let me tell you a quick story about what I encountered this summer. Um, I was in Guatemala, or not this summer, last summer. Last summer I was in Guatemala, and there was this, uh, this gentleman on the street corner. And as I was walking down the street uh, of Antigua, he was passing out these little brochures, these little flyers, and so I took one. And as I began to look at it, I began to notice that he was promoting um, uh, an Islamic group that was trying to start in Antigua. And as I read through the material, I noticed that it said nothing about what they believed or their doctrine or anything about Islam, but it, what it highlighted was what they did for humanity. And, and it talked about all the good things that Islam does. And, and, and it went on to show pictures of, of these Muslim doctors who were taking care of people and starting hospitals and then it talked about people who were in need, like during natural disasters, that it was the Muslims who were there, and they were on the first on the scenes to help people. And so I started thinking about that. I was like, you know, if I was going to start a, a movement in a foreign country like, like Guatemala, who is foreign to Islam, uh, their, their roots are in Roman Catholicism, I'd probably do the same thing. I, I wouldn't talk about what we believed. I would talk about what we do. Because like the old adage goes is that people don't really care what you know it's they want to care how does it go <laughs> how much how much you care yeah, that's how it goes they don't care how much you know but they want to see how much you care now brothers and sisters i'll tell you that that's that was given to the church the church has always been the ones who are supposed to let people know what we believe but we're also supposed to be the people that show how much we care and if i if i'm honest for just a moment i think that that churches, at least in my generation, have, have got it wrong. Because when we think about Christians and you see what's going on in the world and you, you see people talk about Christians, they never really talk about all the good things Christians do. Maybe 100 years ago that's what was, was said, but now what, what is typically said is that Christians, they're narrow-minded. They're uh, hypocrites. They... They bash people with their beliefs. Do you ever hear some of this, what people identify as Christians? Typically, people, they don't want anything to do with, with, with Christianity because we have spent so much time and energy talking about what we believe and defending what we believe and not showing love. And somehow you got to have both. you got to have both. you got to be able to do both. I'll, I'll give you a, an example. Um, I was a... In my 20s when I came to know the Lord. And I, got, I had the privilege of going to my, my church. My church is a, a, in Denton, Texas, Denton Bible Church. Is, it was an is an incredible church. And I believe the pastor there is, is gifted with the gift of teaching. I mean, I, I've listened to thousands of pastors in my life, and this guy can handle the word. He had, like, most of the New Testament memorized. He was just walking around with just so much biblical knowledge. And so he had this, this ability to train and disciple young men. And so 40 of us one summer 
sp- or actually one year, spent under his teaching. We'd get up every morning at 6 o'clock, and we would show up to the church, and he would open up the Word of God, and he would teach us. And so for a whole year, we would just take copious notes of the Old Testament. We were just learning. And, and we got known among the, the people as, as Tommy boys. His name was Tom, and we were Tommy boys. And he changed it, and he called it Young Guns. And he, because we were in our 20s, and he, he said, you, you are my young guns. And he said, you're going to go out and do great things for the Lord. And he said, but I'm going to give you the word of God. So we spent a whole year just getting the word of God. Now, here's, here's what happened after that year. A lot of us went on to ministry. I would say majority of us went on to ministry. But then I found out from people who were not associated with Denton Bible that here's, this is the honest truth. I would come into contact with people, and they said, oh, you went to Denton Bible? And I'm like, yeah, I was a Tommy gun. You know, I was a young gun. And then they, this is where the response was. They said, those guys are jerks. And I was like, what do you mean we're jerks? Those guys know a lot, but they don't really show how much they care for people. They just walk around spouting off how much information they have. And that, that kind of opened my eyes for a second because in my mind, we were doing some really good things. But in other people's minds that we knew a lot, but we were just being jerks. Jerks for Jesus. And, and I remember, and I started thinking back about my own personal life, and I remember I, I came out of a fraternity, okay? So you got to understand a little bit about my background. And I got into the program, and I got into this discipleship, and I started learning a lot, and I was real excited, and I wanted to tell people what I was knowing. But I remember one time walking down campus at North Texas, and there was this young lady that I knew through the, the fraternity circles, and, and, and I said, she said, I haven't seen you around the fraternity house in a long time. And I was like, yeah. I said, you know, I've been going to church, and I've been learning a lot. And she goes, yeah, you, me too. I've been going to church. And I'm like, you've been going to church? She's like, yeah, I've been going to church. I was like, awesome. And, and she goes, I'm in Bible study right now. I was like, really? What are you studying? She said, I'm studying the book of Palms. See, some of y'all don't even, y- y'all, haven't, y'all, haven't, y'all don't even know what that means yet. She meant to say what? Psalms. And in my arrogance, I corrected her, and I told her, it's not, it's not palms, it's psalms, you know. And, I, again, I elevated myself, and I could see in her face that she was, like, shrinking. But I feel like I know a lot. I'm here to help you. And she's like, you're being a jerk. In fact, this other young lady, she was telling me the same thing, and my wife was telling me the same thing the other day about people in her life is that, you know, when we were young in our faith, we were so zealous for truth that when we talked to people, they said, yeah, we want to know more about Jesus, but we just don't want to know more about people like you because you can be rude and mean. Now, now, where am I going with all this? Jesus was full of grace and full of truth. And so as we serve like Jesus, my heart's desire is that our actions, our actions speak louder than our words. Is it still not flipping, Philip? If you can flip the slide, I would appreciate it. If you can't, I'll have to go old school. And old school? Okay. It's Shalom John. There it is. Turn with me to the book of John, please. John chapter 13 is the passage we're going to look at this morning. The context of this is right before the Passover. This is what we know as the Last Supper. So Jesus has sent his disciples into Jerusalem to prepare a place for the Passover meal. They don't have a a place, so they have to go rent a place. And the disciples themselves have to go and prepare the meal. Verse 1 and 2 is not mentioned there, but you can look at it in your Bibles. And it talks about how Jesus knows this is the end. In fact, the next day he's going to the cross. And, and the scripture tells us that he loved his disciples to the end. This is it. This is his no more preaching, no more miracles, no more anything. This is it. This is his last day on earth. And he's got one more teaching opportunity with his disciples. In verse 3 it says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the mill and he took off his outer clothing And he wrapped a towel around his waist. 
And after that, he poured water into a basin and he began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. Okay, so remember, this is right before the Passover meal. Customary what takes place in someone's house, if you invite somebody over for dinner, uh, then that host offers a servant to come and wash your feet for a lot of reasons. One is to show hospitality. You've been traveling, your feet are dirty, and it's just like, hey, come in, be comfortable, take your shoes off, come on in. But two, it's really for the, the host of the house because when you eat, you don't eat in tables with chairs. You eat on the floor on pillows. And if you're reclining next to somebody on the floor, then your feet are next to somebody. And if you got dirty feet and you're trying to eat, man, it's gonna not going to be a good experience for anyone. So historically, what would happen is that you would have the host who invited you. Come on in. We're glad you're here. We've cleaned the house. We prepared a meal for you. Come on in. Servant, go wash his feet. Show him hospitality. The lowest of the lowest would come and wash the feet of the person coming into the house. Now, remember, there's nobody here because they rented this place, so there's no servant present. Now, I'll give you an example of of what this looks like. In Luke chapter 7, there's a story of a of Jesus getting invited over to a Pharisee's house. Some of you probably remember this story. So Jesus is invited to this Pharisee's house. His name is Matthew, and Jesus comes over to the house, and he invites him over, and he's beginning to eat the meal. And then a woman shows up, and the, the, the Scriptures tells us that she's a sinful woman. She wasn't invited but she shows up. Somehow she comes into the scene and she's now comes to the feet of Jesus. And if you remember, she begins to cr- weep and cry. And she begins to wet his feet. And she takes her hair and she begins to dry his feet. And then she takes perfume and she begins to pour it on his feet. And, and the Pharisee says, if you, Jesus, if you're really a, a prophet, you would know what kind of woman this is. And then Jesus looks at the, the Pharisee and he said, you know what? I've been here and you didn't even offer a servant to wash my feet. You didn't offer oil for my my head, and you didn't even kiss me on the cheek, which is customary. You know, in other words, what he was doing, that Pharisee, what he was doing is he was going through all the motions of hospitality, inviting Jesus into his home, and he really didn't want him there. He just went through the motions. And, you know, I think sometimes Christians, us, sometimes if we're not careful, we become just like that group of people, and I'll tell you why. Because we go through a lot of energy trying to invite people into Vista Community Church. We went, come on in, come on in, come just as you are, come on in, come on in. And the people come on in and we ignore them. And if you're a part of this church, then in the typical sociological thing that we often do is we talk to the people we know. And we have greeters outside who are, that's their ministry. Their ministry is to greet you. And they and you and you know what? This is the worst thing. And, and, and this is not from our church, but I have seen churches. This is what I've seen. I've seen people greeting and greeting ministries, and they're just chit chatting with each other, and new people walk right by. Or, or new people come in and and they're on their phone. That's not greeting. If you really want to like be open to like having people come in guests, then then the, the greeters they're they're that's their ministry to greet. But let me tell you something. It's not just their ministry. If somehow somebody slides through the greeter ministry and they come into this, and if you are a part of Vista and you're a member of this church, you've been coming for a long time, and you see somebody you don't know, guess what? It's your responsibility to go and say, hey, my name is such and such, and welcome. You've been here? Is this your first time? Oh, you're an elder. I didn't realize that. (laughs) The joke is some of you have been here for a long time, and and you don't really know who's who anymore, and that's okay, but, but you can greet somebody, right? This is, what, this is what the Pharisee did. He offered him hospitality. Now, Jesus is doing something here. Notice in verse 4, notice in verse 3, it says, He knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and he had come from God and was returning to God. In other words, he knows who he is. His significance is in his lordship, right? Before he was born of a virgin, he was already seated at the right hand of the Father. He was, Colossians tells us that all things were created by him and for him and for his glory. He is God. Emmanuel, God is with us. He is God's flesh, right? So you think that of all the people in the room, God 
in the flesh should not be the one washing feet, right? In fact, the other gospel accounts tells us that there was a dispute that took place during this meal among the apostle, um, yeah, among the apostles. And you know what they're arguing about? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? In the kingdom, I want to sit at the right hand of you, Jesus. And they start arguing with each other. And meantime, meanwhile, they're, they're about to have a meal. And the customary thing is somebody's got to wash the feet. And they all look at each other. I'm not going to do it. What about you, Peter? No, man, not me. I walk on water. You know? What have you done? You know? Well, John's like, well, I'm the one that's known as the one Jesus loves, you know, so it can't be me, you know, I can't do that. Bartholomew, how about you? No one really knows your name. <laughs> Bartholomew's like, yeah, I guess you're right. I'm kind of a low man on the totem pole. I guess I'm going to go wash Jesus' feet, you know, I mean, that's customary. Somebody's got to do it. Nobody likes to serve, right? I mean, I'll give you a real life example. A couple of weeks ago, we were, I'm not going to tell you the location, but I'll tell you the restaurant. We were at Bill Miller. Okay? I'm not knocking the barbecue. I'm just knocking the bathroom. My little one had to go to the restroom. And I was like, can you wait? Can you wait till we get home? No, I got to go, Dad. So I went into the stall, and it was nasty. No toilet paper, and the thing was just nasty. So. I did what every responsible dad would do. I told Elizabeth. <laughs> and she told the cashier. And the cashier told the manager. And the manager told some one of the employees to go and put toilet paper and clean the bathroom. So I was like, okay, give him a few minutes. So the guy comes back out, and he's got a couple of extra toilet paper rolls with him, and, and he's getting a drink of water. He's done. He's clean. And we're like, okay, let's go in. We go in. There's a fresh thing of toilet paper, but the toilet seat is just all still dirty. In fact, it looked like it got smeared around a little bit. <laughs> Josiah, can you just hold it? <laughs> I got to go, Dad. I got to go, Dad. All right. So I'm not an employee, but I did what any good dad would do, and I humbled myself, and I got paper towels, and I got soap and water, and I began to clean the toilet for my son, right? Probably cleaner than that toilet has ever been, because <laughs> uh, my son's not going to sit on it unless it's like, I'm giving way too much information. So, <laughs> so. The point is, is that somebody's got to do it, but nobody wants to do it. The manager didn't want to go do it. The cashier didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it, and that employee didn't want to do it. But somebody's got to do it. Here, Jesus is God in the flesh, and he's looking around at his disciples. He's like, "You, I've been with you for three years. For three years, you've seen me serve. You've seen me, like, touch people who have leprosy, and nobody else wanted to be around them. You've seen me touch people with bleeding disorders. You've seen me touch, you know, all sorts of people that are considered unclean. You've seen me do that. And now I'm about to leave you. And you still don't get it because nobody wants to serve. And so he's like, okay, I'll do it. In fact, this is not his first time to serve. His whole life has been a life of service. Ultimately, it's going to be the life of service at the cross. But so what he does is he, he takes off his, his outer garment. And guys, this is a picture of him stepping out of the throne room of heaven. You remember, you, you, you remember in Superman, the movies, when he's Clark Kent? He's Clark Kent, right? But then he does this, and what happens? He's Superman. He, he, he reveals who he is. When Jesus is in the throne room of heaven, he's sitting there clothed in glory. And all of a sudden, he gets up from the second hand of the Father. And he's like, I'm going to become like them, my creation. And he removes his outer glory, and he becomes a human. And he's born of a virgin, and he takes on humanity. And he walks around sinful people. And though he never sinned, he was among the sinners. And he does the ultimate 
not only does he become like us, he becomes the least of us, and he becomes the servant, and he begins to wash his disciples' feet. And the scripture tells us this. He becomes a servant. You know, I'll tell you one more little quick story. Well, maybe not. Or maybe I'll save it for another time. Or maybe I'll tell you. <laughs> I don't even know what it is, but y'all are like, what is it now? Um, yeah, I'll tell you this real quick. A- and I'm not trying to knock on my 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 the church that I went to because I really have high respect for Denton Bible, and I'm not trying to, to, to knock on the seminary that I attended because I really value the seminary that I attended, Dallas Theological Seminary. But I will tell you this, uh, and this is this, they will tell you this now. Uh, Dallas Theological Seminary has always been known as a seminary to produce guys that can handle the Word of God. Okay? If, you, if you've ever associated anybody with Dallas Theological Seminary, they've always been people that can handle the Word of God. You spend a tremendous amount of time studying God's Word, studying doctrine, studying church history, studying how to preach, uh, leadership. You do all these things, okay? But, but here's the thing. You go on campus to Dallas Theological Seminary, and they have a big sign, and it says, Preach the Word. And every student that ever walks along that campus, they see the sign every day and they're reminded that we are to be faithful to God's word and we are to proclaim God's word. That's what we are here for. But on campus, there is a statue. And it's a statue of Jesus. And he's washing Peter's feet. And, and too often, we don't associate with the servant of Jesus. We associate with pro- proclamation of God's word. And the tension is this, that seminaries produce pastors pastors lead churches and if a pastor enters into the congregation with only the mindset of teaching 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 then what will the congregation's value be teaching and there's nothing wrong with teaching teaching is important teaching is our foundation but teaching is not for more information teaching is for life transformation to become like christ And once you become like Jesus, then you have to serve. And so Jesus, I love the fact that this is the last thing he's going to do on earth, and he serves. Okay, let's, let's take a look at it real quick. So now he comes to Simon Peter, and he said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So now Simon Peter is watching what's taking place. Everybody's getting their feet washed. Have you ever had your feet washed? I'm not talking about pedicures. (laughs) Have you ever had someone wash your feet? Anybody? Seriously? And and tell me, was was it humbling? Did you feel like, I mean, it felt like you shouldn't be doing this, right? You felt more clean? You felt more clean. What about, I, I had my feet washed once by my, my senior pastor, and it was, it was just the awkwardest thing in the world. He was my senior pastor, and he washed all the elders' feet, and he washed my, my feet, and I just, I was like, something's not right here. You know, you're, you're, the, you're not supposed to be washing our feet. And I, I, I liked it, it like, eh, a little bit more, you know. But Peter's, Peter knows something. Peter's like, this is not right, Jesus. Bartholomew should be washing our feet. <laughs> but, P- but Jesus says, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Really what a lot of theolo- theologians are saying is that he's going to the cross, and tomorrow his bloodshed is going to wash all the disciples for those who believe. And they will be clean. And then he goes on to tell him, he says, Then the Lord Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, then my hands and my feet as well. And Jesus answered, Whoa, 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 whoa. Jesus said, Those who've had a bath, you've had a bath, right, Peter? Those who've had a bath, he says, Those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet, 
their whole body is clean, and you are clean physically. Though not every one of you, and he looks over at, who do you think he looks at? Judas should have been the one to wash the feet. I don't know why we're picking on Bartholomew. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that is why he said not everyone was clean. So let me just share, take a moment real quick. i got to pause and interject an important message here. Okay, so what gets you right with the Father? What, what makes you clean in, in the Father's eyes? Blood of Jesus. That's the only thing that gets you right with the Father, the blood of Jesus. That's going to happen the next day at the cross, the crucifixion. So every one of them is going to be clean except for the one who would betray him and not put his faith in them, and that is Judas. Now, that, that same message holds true today, guys. Coming to church is a good thing. Serving is a good thing. But salvation is from God. And every one of us here at some point, must put their faith in Jesus Christ to be clean from your sins. And if you are clean, then you are sanctified. And if you are sanctified, then you can walk in a new way of living, or justified and then sanctified. Now, let me just look at the second bullet point real quick, and then we'll close with the last verse because I know it's getting really hot in here. So as saints, guys, if you are a Christian, if you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then you have been forgiven. But You and I, once we become Christians, are not supposed to be isolated from the world. Let me repeat that. Once you and I become Christians, you and I are not supposed to be isolated from the world. Now let me repeat that one more time. You and I become Christians. We're not supposed to be isolated from the world. Let me tell you what the reality is. Most Christians who become who walk with the Lord, this is the honest truth. Over time, they don't even know people who are not Christians anymore. Think about it for a moment. Who are the people you hang out with? Are they Christians? I hope so. But do you know non-Christians? What happens is we become insulated and isolated from the world. I have been there, guys. I have been there. In fact, when I became a Christian, I left all my fraternity brothers, and I surrounded myself with my Christian friends. And for the next couple of years until I graduated, it's all I did was spend time with Christians. But I'm here to tell you that that is not why Jesus has left the church here on this earth, is to, to be saved and then to come and do a holy huddle and then isolate ourselves from the world. We're, we don't want to get dirty, Jesus. We don't want to get messy, Jesus. We don't want to be around those people because they're sinners. We don't want to, you know, wait a second. Whoa, 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 whoa. If we're going to be like Jesus, Jesus was not afraid to get dirty because he knew who he was. He is God flesh, and he knew where he was going. And, and if you are born again, then you know where you're going, and you know who you are, and you're a king's kid, and you can serve like him because he served you, and you don't need to isolate yourself, remove yourself from the things, from the people of this world, but you can be a bridge and point them to Jesus. But too many times, church, too many times, we do what's called a holy huddle, and we just gather with other Christians, and we we come, and we we hear the, the word of God proclaim, and we all agree with it. Yes, amen, amen, amen. And, and then we, we, you know, sing songs, and then we go out, and we just, like, don't do anything with our faith. But that's not why we're here. We're here because we're supposed to become more like him. We're not supposed to just know a lot. We're supposed to let it transform us into being his hands and feet. And some of us don't want to get messy. But I'm telling you, you're clean. Your feet might get dirty, but you get a, you're clean already. You're going to heaven. You are clean. You are forgiven. But your feet will get dirty. Your hands will get dirty when you're around dirty people. And if you find yourself in those situations where you're, where you're you know, and I'm not saying I'll never give you the green light to go live a life of sin, never, because the Bible never teaches it. But I will always challenge you to not be in the Christian holy huddle, but to always be out there for those who are far from God. But if you find yourself in sin, it's important to confess that sin daily. 
Repent daily. Confess the sin daily. But you can't be like, well, I'm this person who is not going to be around sinners because I don't want to get my hands dirty. No, that's why you're here. That's why Jesus is here. Jesus, you know who he washed? He washed all their feet, all the saints, but he washed whose also? Judas. So when he finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes, returned to his place. Do you understand what I've done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher. You call me Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord, and your teacher have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set an example that you should do as I have done for you. He's not talking about them turning around now and washing each other's feet. He's talking about service. Ultimate service is sacrificial service for one another to put other people before you. Love. That's what he's talking about. Then he goes on and says, Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor his messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you, what? If you do them. In other words, you have opportunity to not do them. That's the sad part. You'll be blessed if you do them. I've set the example. If you follow my example, then you'll be blessed. But here's the reality. A lot of us, yes, we know. Yes, we agree. Yes, I know. And you don't do anything with it. Let me bring this full circle real quick and then we'll end. If you're new to Vista, like, like we said earlier, we welcome you, okay? Our, our door is open. Air conditioning is not working, but our door is open. You're a guest, okay? We welcome you, and we want to greet you. We want to welcome you. We want to get to know you. We want to provide a place for you to sit. And if we ever, like, you know, like, oh, that's my seat. No, that's not how it works here. You know, we like, oh, you're new? Let me find a place for you to sit. Come and have a seat. Here, you know, have the best seat. The best seat is the front row. Nobody wants to sit here. But, but you can sit here. We want to welcome you. We want to be hospitable to you. We want to serve you. Please understand that. We, we want to. We, sometimes we give out gifts. I think we're out of the free gifts, and we're, we're getting these new little gifts. And if you come back next week, we'll give you these new gifts. It's a koozie. It's not a coffee cup. It's too hot for coffee cups. But here's the honest truth. You become part of this church. We don't want to just serve you anymore. Now, we'll serve one another, but this church is not existing to serve you. You've been here long enough. You say this is my church. You want to become a member. Then you have a responsibility to the body of Christ, and that is to serve one another. Because at some point, when you become family, mom is not going to keep making the meals for you. You go make your own meal, right? I'll give you the best example that I can think of. How many of you have ever been on a cruise ship? You pay your money, right? And you go. And you get entertained. And there's a cruise director. And everybody's like bending over backwards for you. And they're feeding you and all you can eat and anything you want to do. And the next show starts here and you just have a good time. That's the church for a lot of people. Well, I give my money and, and I... You know, expect my kids to have the greatest ministry, and I expect the pastor to have a good sermon. I expect, and you become a spectator. That's not Christianity. That's called consumerism. How many of you ever been on a on a naval ship? Y'all have never been to the, the naval carrier place down Corpus Christi? Oh, okay. So, if you're in the military, any former military people? Some of y'all? What would it be like if you went to the military and you're like, you know, I just want to kind of just come and hang out a little bit, you know? <laughs> I'm in for four, but, you know, two of those years, let me just kind of check it out. I, w- I, like, I like the, you know, the if I need to go get the, the chow hall, I, I got that, and PT, can we do that optional maybe? And then, 
you know, and then, you know, the dress code is just, I'm not feeling it right, you know. I just, I, I don't like what I, we have to wear all the time. So I want to do my own thing. And, oh, we're going to war? Nah, let's talk about this. I don't know, you know. I, I'm not going, you know. I, I, I want to, but no. But do I still get the GI Bill? Because I think that's important, right? And I need my holidays off, and I need my, you know, other things. So, No, you would be, people were like, what are you talking about? The church, guys, is like a battle that you are in, a spiritual battle. You are part of the army of God in the spiritual realm to advance his kingdom over darkness. And you come, and you have a role to play. Even if it's just a small role or a huge role, you have a role to play. And it's not an option to go to spiritual war. It's not an option to to, you know, to go into battle with your brothers and sisters. But that's not how we see church. We see church as a convenience that I'll do on the side, maybe, if I'm up to it. Oh, it's hot outside. Oh, it's raining. Oh, it's a beautiful day to travel. Oh, I don't know if I want to go to church this weekend. Ah, oh, whatever, 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 whatever. And then you show up and you don't, just serve me. Pastor, just serve me. Just serve me. No, that's not the church. Guys, I'm going to be honest with you. I'll just shoot straight with you. We have a lot of people in this church that serve. In fact, we had guys out at the, at the property yesterday, and they were tying uh, rebarb together, and they're preparing for the foundation of poor. And it was hot out there. And I, and I actually showed up, and I was assistant to the assistant foreman. I showed up late, left early, took pictures, and left. <laughs> True story. But here in this church, we got, we got all sorts of people that serve. We got people that make coffee. We got people that greet you. We got people that film. We got people that, that preach. We got small group leaders. We got the worship team. We have children's ministry. We have the audiovisual. We have all these ministries. We have set up. We have takedown. We have all these ministries. And a lot of people serve faithfully. But I'm going to just shoot straight with you. If you are somebody here at Vista Community Church and you say this is a church that I want to be a part of, then we expect you to find a place to serve. It could be a little place. It doesn't have to be a, a big thing you do, but there's always. When you don't do that, you make it harder on the people who do serve because they got to carry your weight and their weight. But if you just do little things, Everybody is healthier. And the reason why we do it is not because we need you. This church has been around for 11 years. I've seen so many faces come and go. And yes, I'll be honest with you. When people leave and they leave a hole, it hurts. Like, oh, we need those people. Oh, and then God brings somebody else up. But I'm here to tell you, we're not here to twist your arm to serve at Vista Community Church because we need somebody to plug a hole. We're here to teach you to serve because Jesus served. And you can't be like Jesus if you don't serve. That's an oxymoron. I want to be like Jesus, but I don't want to serve. Well, then you're following the wrong person. Because he's the ultimate servant that gave his life up. And if he's willing to give his life up for you, he's expecting you to do something for him, for his kingdom and for his glory. Now, just for warning, for the next three weeks, we're talking about this topic. So if you don't want me to preach about serving, you're just like, well, I'll be back in July. <laughs> Come back in July because we'll talk about tithing. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'll see you in August. <laughs> <laughs>